Sajid Javid, UK Chancellor, is set to attend the World Economic Forum in Davos, an elite ski resort famous for its glamorous clientele, in spite of an apparent ban by Boris Johnson on ministers attending the champagne event with the global elite. Mr Johnson's allies had said before Christmas that ministers wouldn't attend the event in the Swiss Alps, arguing that it was at odds with the priorities of the Prime Minister as leader of a people's government. News of Mr Johnson's supposed Davos ban was received with raised eyebrows at the Treasury when it was announced before Christmas. Mr Javid, a former international banker who was earning over £3 million a year at Deutsche Bank before becoming an MP in 2010, is unlikely to feel out of place at the event running from January 21st to the 24th. But is this a wise move from the so-called People's Government? Perhaps ministers should be reminded of Hayek's observation that the curious task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they really know about what they imagine they can design. People come back from Davos and tell institutions such as universities, for example, what they should be teaching for the next 30 years. They tell businesses how they should develop their corporate governance and decide upon their research and development agendas. Worse than this, the whole Davos setup seems to be designed to promote a forum for rent seekers, in which powerful people in business and NGOs who wish to obtain favours from government can meet and discuss how the interests of big business and global institutions can be furthered. My guest today couldn't agree with that more strongly, I think it's safe to say. Dr Richard Wellings argues that Davos is the perfect environment for crony capitalism to flourish and that we should leave it to the skiers. Industry, Richard says, should be shaped by the dispersed decisions of 7 billion consumers and tens of millions of businesses. It should not be shaped by politicians. Yet Davos remains a huge magnet for politicians to work alongside leaders of the largest businesses and other vested interests to devise yet more regulations, more interventions and further barriers to entry that will undermine competition, making it even harder for smaller businesses to operate in their markets. Richard, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you, Darren. Now, Richard, I wonder if you can start by setting out what your definition of crony capitalism is is and what rent seekers are well in essence uh, crony capitalism is when uh, governments grant special privileges to particular individuals or businesses these might be in the form of uh, regulations that shut out competition uh, subsidies direct or indirect now it takes various forms mm. uh, most obviously in a lot of developing countries when Perhaps the main businesses are owned by the, the president's family uh, and obviously uh, any competition is ruthlessly suppressed. But in developing country, in developed countries, it's more like say, the form of a distributional coalition. So special interests uh, that have a strong economic incentive to uh, lobby politicians hard for these kind of regulations that uh, stifle competition, say protectionism against imports or uh, regulations that... Uh, creates a particular uh, form of market structure that makes uh, creates barriers to entry from smaller businesses. And unfortunately, it's difficult to find uh, many sectors where crony capitalism isn't a problem. This is actually uh, pervasive, even in Western economies. Mm. So then, Richard, tell me why you think Boris Johnson should have been a bit stricter on this reported ban that we heard about before Christmas and ensured the UK government was well away from d the Davos meeting of the global elite. Well, clearly, it's, it's very wrong that a policy is often determined in, in this way and are disproportionately influenced by uh, the business elite rather than the, the wider population. But then again, uh, ministers face a bit of a dilemma here because, of course, they're dealing with the world as it is, not as how, how they would like it to be. And obviously, a lot of these big businesses are hugely powerful. They control huge amounts of capital and could potentially invest in this country or that country. So, you know, there is a dilemma here that they have to, if you like, um, be cordial with these kind of people because they do control a lot of investment. Mm. So then when the if you think about when the World Economic Forum started in the early 70s, it began with lots of good intentions. I think you can safely say it was supposed to be about improving the world, right? An annual get together that was meant to allow the leaders of the day an opportunity to 
improve, and I quote, improve the state of the world by engaging business, political, academic, and other leaders of society to shape global, regional, and industry agendas. There's nothing wrong with those aims, is there? Well, the, the question is whose aims are those? You know, who, who decides what is good for the world economy? And the problem there is it was a very a narrow elite deciding uh, the way things would be pushed. Uh, and a classic example is um, the environmentalist agenda. Uh, while there may be you know, a good rationale for some of it, obviously it's, it has had a devastating effect on the living standards of a lot of people on low incomes as their energy bills and transport bills have been pushed up. Um, and this is clearly a top-down imposition that was imposed by governments without consulting the people. Uh, even you know, sort of massive agenda through the media, trying to, uh, if you like, manufacture consent for these policies as well. Very much a top-down initiative. Mm-hmm. So that's an example of something that has a massive impact, and there's not really any proper consent initially. It's very much a top-down driven process. So it it speaks to the problem of uh, centrally planning the economy rather than leaving it to the dispersed preferences of individuals. The most famous example of that being the net zero target being pushed through by statutory instrument. It wasn't even debated in the House of Commons. Uh, That's right. And then similarly, the uh, the plan to uh, make uh, you know electric cars effectively compulsory by twenty thirty or twenty forty. I mean, this kind of central planning is what you associate with you know the Soviet Union, not Western economies. But of course, although there's you know a lot more flexibility in Western economies. huge sectors are in fact effectively centrally planned in terms of the general direction. Mm -hmm. So Davos attendees have more in common with one another at the $52,000 per ticket event than they have with the citizens of the countries that they come from. So how do you think politicians can reconnect their economic policies that they espouse with those that they purportedly represent? Well, I think um, withdrawing from these kind of uh, elite conferences will be a, a good first step in terms of signalling the intention to move away from this top-down elitism, which has become hugely unpopular and rightly so. Mm-hmm. But I think it's also about actually giving uh, ordinary people more freedom to create their own, uh, to fulfil their own economic preferences. So this will be a massive deregulation, so making it much easier for people to uh, Uh, start and expand their own businesses, get rid of all this red tape that makes it so difficult in so many areas, that would really invigorate a lot of these struggling communities across the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what what about taxes? Do you think taxes should come down? They should, but unfortunately that's going to be very difficult because, um, you know, we're facing a rapidly aging population that's going to uh, put more and more uh, pressure on the NHS and social care, etc. So, I think that's going to be very difficult in the medium term just from a political perspective. I mean, if yeah. that could be shifted over to a voluntary provision, I mean, that would be great and you've got to get a huge efficiency and productivity gains. But at the moment, it's difficult to see how that would be politically possible. Yeah. I mean, because that leads me quite neatly on to the next question. A Davos ban is one of the few areas, isn't it, where the economic liberals in the Conservative Party that have been there for a number of years, especially during the, you know, that on from the Thatcher years, um, in the Conservative Party, can unite with its new former Labour voters to oppose the forces that have the veneer of being pro-business, but in reality have created a culture which is actually quite hostile to a free economy? That's right. And, you know, when you talk about uh, being pro-business, often the big businesses are the biggest enemies of a free market. The last thing they want is to remove these special privileges that governments have granted them. So, I mean, a classic example was, you know, the financial sector, the way it received these vast bailouts after the financial crisis. If it wasn't for those bailouts at the expense of taxpayers and savers, then obviously uh, much of the banking sector we know now would have been toast. Mm -hmm. And there are your whole swathes of the economy are, are propped up by these special privileges. It's a very unfair system. And because obviously this feeds into the kind of Marxist analysis as well, even though that's wrong headed in its solutions, it's unfortunately this kind of credit capitalism has really been, you know, it's been an absolute bonus for the hard left because it just feeds into their theories of how the world works. So it's really important to uh, tackle this and have a real sort of attack on all this red tape and bureaucracy that feeds crony capitalism. And I mean, it is actually really important from a um, a PR perspective, mm. I think, for market capitalism, right? Because if you look at, if we think about the financial mm. crash that you raised earlier, a lot of these these bankers that were making these really risky mortgage offers for example that were pushing these really risky mortgage offers at about three times someone's salary for example 
they got really big golden goodbyes, right? They were getting really cushy pensions, often at millions of pounds and actually about a million quid to see them off, right? And that's while shareholders have lost everything. That's while in many cases, uh, whilst no one at Northern Rock, for example, saw a loss in their savings, shareholders must be looking at that and thinking, what on earth? And then the PR perspective from the outside world must be, well, capitalism isn't all it's cracked up to be. Exactly. It was a disaster for the free market side because obviously uh, free market has got tarred with the brush that it was this was a free market problem when in fact it wasn't. It was all to do with um, central banks trying to uh, centrally plan the money supply, uh, create, creating these huge bubbles uh, that then obviously then crashed disastrously. Mm-hmm. Um it's a massive problem. What we've got to do is try and explain why uh, this wasn't a free market problem. It was a problem of too much regulation, too much intervention that would never have happened in a genuine free market. But it's hard to get that argument across mm-hmm. uh, because obviously uh, the general public don't really see the distinctions between different different economic models. They just see it all as free market or all as socialist. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, this has been a, a real disaster. And of course, um, the response to the financial crisis, all this... Uh, uh, money printing and bailouts has created, if you like, uh, zombie economies in the West, most obviously in the Eurozone. And so, you know, it might have, it might have addressed the threat of a very short, sharp shock, 1930s style depression, but we're still living with the, the hangover now. And there's been no real resolution. And this eventually is going to cause chaos, I would think. Mm. So then um, I want to take you back quite some time to America's seventh <laughs> president. Now, Andrew Jackson had a very useful perspective on this issue, I think. He said, there are no necessary evils in government, he said. Its evils exist only in its abuses. If it would confine itself to equal protection and, as heaven does its reins, shower its favours alike on the high and the low, the rich and the poor, it would be an unqualified blessing. So do you think... He had it right. I think that's a very naive point of view. I think um, government failure is is really in uh, government's DNA. Um, And I think even if you had the best possible theoretical constitution and the best possible rule of law legal system, you're still going to get these problems because it's basically to do with uh, human nature and economic incentives. So uh, concentrated special interests like some of these big businesses, they have massive economic uh, incentives to engage in uh, lobbying of politicians to get these special favours from them. Whereas the taxpayers and consumers, these dispersed interests, have very weak incentives to engage in lobbying behaviour. They have even have weak incentives even to get well informed about these issues because the difference it will make is very tiny for them as an individual compared to this huge difference it will make if, for example, some big business gets a big government contract or if mm. they get um, some protectionist law that prevents competition from abroad, etc., etc., so as long as you've got this this sort of these strong economic incentives, then it's going to be a re- government's always going to be corrupted. It's just human nature. Mm. So the only long term solution is to really reduce the scope of the state, so mm-hmm. the opportunities for this kind of uh, cronyism are reduced markedly. Mm. Yeah. So that, and then I think to end, then Richard, if you can summarise as you've just said, why our first task should be to recognise that government must have its limits. And in order to avoid creating the groundwork for crony capitalism and all the bad things that come with it, like favouritism, waste, theft and other forms of corruption are limited. Yeah, I mean, it's not just about um, reducing uh, the size of governments and the scope of government. It's also about raising awareness of this problem so that people can recognise it when they see it. If they think, you know, why is the government going ahead with this crazy project? that's going to cost you know, tens of billions of pounds and it just makes no economic sense. HS2. Well, I don't want to mention <laughs> HS2. But then, you know, if people get into the habit of looking at, you know, who are the special interests who have been pushing this over the years, and they might find in that case it was, for example, the, uh, the high-speed train manufacturers who were really driving the lobbying process in the early days because there's this huge eight billion pound contract to build the trains and only probably two or three companies are likely to get that work so there is these massive economic incentives so once people get into the habit of looking for this they'll see it all over the place and hopefully that will create a political impulse for ministers to be a bit sort of cautious about engaging in this kind of behavior Mm, yeah Mm. so well well, or perhaps we on the more sceptic side of the public spending or taxpayer spending uh, side of the argument need to be 
pushing these things out a lot better than we are currently. That's right. Uh, and unfortunately, there's a kind of unwillingness to accept just how pervasive this is. And if you look at it sector by sector or look at the FTSE 100 uh, index, for example, you'll see that probably the vast majority of those companies are are benefiting from special privileges of various kinds. And going back historically as well, it's been a major problem you know, for centuries now. And a lot of these companies are heavily reliant on uh, basically government aggression in the past for their, their current profit. So mm. Uh, I think we need to be aware of the scale of the problem here. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Richard. Now, Richard, if people want to find you on Twitter, what's your Twitter handle? It's at Richard Welling, isn't it? Yeah, I managed to get the my actual name amazingly. It doesn't get easier than that, <laughs> does it, really? Well, you can let us know what you think. Do you reckon we should leave Davos to the skiers like Richard? Or do you think it's a useful meeting of the global elite? You can tweet us at IEA London and you can subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Podbean.